I want to read a word of scripture to you. Uh, 1 Peter 5 and verse 8 says, Be of sober spirit, be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. But he says, But resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being experienced by your brethren who are in the world. But he says, Your adversary, the devil, is prowling around like a roaring lion. Uh, it reminds us that he is at work and he wants to disrupt the things of God, right? And um, a couple things this morning. We have a few members from Grace Baptist Church down the road. They were given the option of uh, visiting with us this morning because there was no power down at Grace. Um, and um, so they're having, there's still service, but no heat and no power. And um, so we have one of our dear families from Grace. But then also we come in here this morning and the technology blew up for a little bit and, and uh, the, the microphone. And, and um, so, um, you know, even our, our back projector was plugged in and turned on. It wouldn't come on. And, and then um, so it reminds us that when we prayed, I took a moment to pray and say, God, release uh, all of this that stuff. And so we should remember that. Um, but it's no wonder um, uh, the title of our message this morning, as you can see there. But it was August 1999, where 100 years of Christian fellowship and unity and evangelism ended because of congregational disharmony. Holy Creek Baptist Church was split into two groups over a piano bench that sit behind their 1923 Steinway piano to the left of the pulpit. Members and friends at Holy Creek Baptist Church say that the old bench was always a source of hospitality. Some people like it and others hate it. They really should have seen this coming. Said one community member, that congregation was getting ready to break for the last 10 years. It was just a matter of shame. It had to be over a piano bench. So because of the split, the Holy Creek congregation was, was, uh, will be having two separate services on Sunday. There was an agreement that was uh, uh, mediated by an outside pastor so that each group would have its own separate service with its own separate pastor. The services were far enough apart so that no group will come in contact with one another and an outside person will come in and will be moving the piano bench to different locations and appropriate positions between services to please all sides and to avoid any further conflict that could result in violence. This arrangement continued for years to come until both congregations eventually closed. Can you imagine? the location of a piano bench splitting a church. It sounds silly, but what would it take to split this church? What would be the thing that causes so much disunity that this church would split or end up closing? It's always when things are going well that the devil brings disunity, and disunity, when not addressed, will end up splitting the people. And let me add that it doesn't have to be over something bad. It could be a disagreement or different points of view on a certain issue or a particular direction. And the devil uses whatever it is to cause unhappiness, which builds and builds and leads to problems. This was the case for Nehemiah. The people were united. They were, they were building and making progress, but an issue arose that threatened to derail the whole project. Not an issue from the outside, but this is something that arose from within, something within their own ranks. If you haven't turned here yet, turn to Nehemiah chapter 5. Nehemiah is an account of the rebuilding of the walls of Jerusalem. But uh, Nehemiah did more than rebuild a wall. Uh, this book is about the restoring of a people from ruin and despair towards a new walk with God. Isn't that what this congregation is trying to do? To rebuild and to restore and 
the enemy would love nothing more than to disrupt that effort. Now, if you remember, after the exile to Babylon, the Jews came back to the land. They were allowed to come back to the land, and they did so in several stages. And when they got to the land, they needed a place to worship. Um, and so they, they laid the foundation of the temple. That was under uh, Ezra. But as soon as the foundation of the temple is laid, they get discouraged and they stop building. And so they take the money that would have been used to finish building the temple and they pour it into their own houses, which God, he encourages them. He says, examine your ways. Remember, he talks about um, in Haggai how they, they, they make money and it's almost like they put it into purses with, pocket, with holes because it just falls out. They, were poor, they had paneled houses. They were pouring everything into their own cells rather than the place of worship. But they eventually complete the temple, and, but the walls of the city remained in ruins. And since the wall was not complete, they were left vulnerable to attacks, and, and, and they, uh, they had become a laughingstock to everyone. And, and so for 90 years, the people say, this can't be done. It can't be rebuilt. But along comes Nehemiah, who, as we know, was the cupbearer to the king, and he heard about the walls being in ruin, and he asked the king's permission to go to Jerusalem to lead the rebuilding effort, and he was granted that. And he leads the people for 90 years when they say it couldn't be done. He leads them in 52 days to get the wall repaired and rebuilt. And things were going well until an issue arose that could derail the whole project. It has been said that the devil would rather start a church fight than sell a barrel of whiskey. If he can get God's people fighting against each other, he can reduce our witness to the community because uh, when God's people fight one another, guess what? They're not fighting the enemy or getting God's work done. Perhaps you've heard of the, the book. Uh, it's a classic book by uh, 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 Leslie Flynn. It's called Great Church Fights. And what it does is it looks throughout the Bible, and we know a lot of these uh, conflicts that happen within the churches in the Bible, you know, that Paul might have written to address and so forth. And that's what he does is he goes through each of those conflicts and he, he adds in these little quips to kind of help you think about it. And he, he talks about it. But in, in, the, in, in the book, Great Church Fights, he, he writes the poem that relates to believers. It says, believe as I believe, no more, no less, that I am right and no one else. Confess, feel as I feel. Think only as I think, eat what I eat, and drink but what I drink. Look as I look, do always as I do, and then and only then I'll fellowship with you. He writes also of a father who heard a commotion in his yard, and he looked outside to see his daughter and several of her playmates in a heated argument. And, and he, he went out and he reprimanded her, and, and her daughter says, why are you reprimanding me? We're just playing church. <laughs> That's how the devil works. He tries to get God's people from within if he can't get us from without. And even though he has many different strategies, sometimes he uses greed and, and, and selfishness fueled by money like he did here in Nehemiah chapter 5. So if you're taking notes, I want you to notice the first thing that we see is we see the complaint by the people. We're in Nehemiah chapter 5. Look at verse 1. Now there was a great outcry of the people and of their wives against their Jewish brothers. Do you see that word outcry? That's a word that means to shriek. In other words, they were freaking out. This outcry was by the men and by their wives against their Jewish brothers. The work stopped because of strife. And it was so bad that in that culture, the wives would not say much, and they were even complaining about it. And what's unfortunate is that the problems were self-caused. Notice letter A, um, that there was a lack of food. He says in verse 2, for 
there were those who said, we, our sons and our daughters, are many. Therefore, let us get grain that we may eat and live. Nehemiah is not a book about money. It's a book about rebuilding and and bringing the people into the place of peace and security. Yet money problems uh, uh, directly affected the rebuilding work that was going on. Now, while they were working on the walls day and night, because they had to get, there was already threats of attack, and so while they were working on the walls, they didn't have time to plant crops. And, and in wartime, you need food. And so the people's point was, too much was being sacrificed to build these walls. And so he says in verse 2, Therefore, let us get grain that we may eat and live. Now, how did this food shortage come about? Look at verse 3. There were others who said, we are mortgaging our fields, our vineyards, and our houses that we might get grain because of the famine. There there were were several things caused by famine. People had money problems, and and so this made food more expensive, and and it was so expensive that they they mortgaged their, their property to provide food. You know, we might think about it, food's pretty high nowadays, right? At least in Massachusetts, and you think about that. And, and so these people were struggling with that. Still, there was another reason for a complaint, letter B, that there was a lack of money. We see in verse 4, and also there were, are those who said, we have borrowed money for the king's tax on our fields and our vineyards. So despite that what was going on, they still had to pay the king's tax, even though they weren't working as much, um, they still had to provide for that. And we'll see that talked about later with Nehemiah. Then the third complaint that we see there was that there was a lack of freedom. Look at verse 5. Now our flesh is like the flesh of our brothers and our children like their children. Yet behold, we are forcing our sons and our daughters to be slaves. And some of our daughters are forced into bondage already. And we are helpless because our fields and vineyards belong to others. Now, back in those times, if you couldn't afford to pay uh, your debt or, or your, your taxes, you could sell your children or, or your wife to be slaves in order to pay what you owed. So it seems like these people had already done that, and it already happened to some. And, and the people um, they were in debt to, what, it wasn't people from the outside, it was their own people. That's why he uses the words in the verse there, our flesh. Their sons and daughters were being sold to fellow Jews in order to buy food. This was a bad situation. Now notice secondly in your notes, the condemnation of the nobles. So we have the complaint of the people and now we have the condemnation of the nobles. Now Nehemiah levels three accusations against them and the first one that we see letter A is that he condemns them for their usury. Look at verse 6. Then I was angry when I heard their outcry and their words. So Nehemiah was not just angry. He was very angry because these money problems were, were caused in part by greed. You had these people these fellow Jews who just wanted to make a profit and, and, and they, they were doing so off the money troubles of their fellow people. This was something that God expressly said was wrong. In Exodus twenty two twenty five. he says, if you lend money to my people, to the poor among you, you are not to act as a creditor to them. You shall not charge him interest. And God's talking about, he says, to my people, to the poor among you, don't charge him interest. And so Nehemiah was very angry because this practice caused disunity um, and, and that the disunity that now existed. And this disunity that was going on, it stopped the work of rebuilding and the unity that exists. And so it must have frustrated him that they could be so strong against some of the attacks of the enemy out there, but fall so quickly to these types of internal problems. But it's interesting how uh, we can also stand against the things on the outside, but then allow issues between us to cause us to downfall. Someone wrote this, for me to love the world 
It's no chore. My problem? The neighbor next door. Isn't that true? It's usually the people that's closest to us that we fight with. Now, what did Nehemiah do about this? Look at verse 7. I consulted with myself and contended with the nobles and the rulers and said to them, you are exacting usury, each from his brother. Therefore, I held a great assembly against them. Now, consulting with himself there means that he had to think about it, right? Um, another translation says that he mastered his feelings. This was, this was the great leadership we see from Nehemiah. And a lot, a lot of people study this book um, to, to see principles of leadership. Um, people do it when they're talking about rebuilding, but there's great leadership from, from Nehemiah. He was a man that was passionate enough to get angry when he saw something that was unjust, but he was wise enough to not act until he thought about it and considered the matter carefully. You see, even though he was rattled, he didn't just go fly off the handle and say whatever he, he, he wanted to say and do whatever he wanted to do, and, and he might regret it. Then look at what he did, verse 7. He says, I consulted with myself and contended with the nobles and the rulers. And again, contended there means to grapple or to to rebuke. Um, These nobles and rulers that we see here, these were the rich people of the time and and their power made them more uh, prone to oppress people. And so he calls them out of it. And he says in verse 7, you are exacting usury, each one from his brother. Now, usury is interest that is usually too high um, or should be, shouldn't be charged at all. And so after he calls them out, he does one more thing in verse 7. Therefore, I held a great assembly against them. And what he does is he calls the people together to be witnesses of what he was saying and to bear testimony against the oppressions that they were causing. Notice letter B is he condemns them for enslavement. And we see this in verse 8 of Nehemiah 5. I said to them, We, according to our ability, have redeemed our Jewish brothers who were sold to the nations. Now, would you even sell your brothers that they may be sold to us? Then they were silent and could not find a word to say. Do you see that first part of the verse where he says, We, according to our abilities, have redeemed our our?" our brothers, our Jewish brothers who were sold to the nations. He's talking about that there were fellow Jews who had spent their own money to, to buy back the freedom of their fellow Jews. And now they're doing the same thing. They're, 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 they're doing what was done with the nations. But he's also pointing out to the fact that God had freed these people from Egypt, right? And he had redeemed them. And, and other nations had enslaved them. You bought them back. Now, how can you do the same thing that was done by the Egyptians and by other nations? This was a line of argument that convicted them because we see here at the end of verse 8, then they were silent and they could not say a word. They had nothing they could say because Nehemiah was right. Notice the third point there, that he condemns them for ruining their testimony. He says in verse 9, Again I said, The things which you are doing is not good. Should you not walk in the fear of our God because of the reproach of the nations, our enemies? He says, This is just plain wrong. He says, The nations around us are watching us. They're seeing how we act, and this is not a good testimony. And so what must they do? They must give back their unjust gains. Look at verse 11. He says, Please give back to them this very day their fields, their vineyards, their olive groves, and their houses, also the hundredth part of the money and of the grain, the new wine and the oil that you are exacting from them. He appealed to them to restore all these things that they had collected and that they had taken. And he says, stop collecting anymore. And did you notice when he said they should do it in the verse? He didn't say, wait till next year when you've reaped some more profit. He said what? This very day. Do it now. And look at their reaction in verse 12. Then they said, we will give it back and will require nothing from them 
and we'll do exactly as you say. So, seems like they were stricken by, by conscience here, and, and although Nehemiah is encouraged by their promise, he doesn't stop at that. He, he takes it a step further. Look at the rest of verse 12. He says, So I called the priests and took an oath from them that they would do according to this promise. He calls the priests in to witness this and to hear from them. And there's a sacredness now to this promise. He doesn't just want their verbal promises. He, he wants them to sign on the dotted line, if you will. And he says in verse 13, I also took out uh, the front of my garment. I shook out the front of my garment and said, Thus may God shake out every man from this, his house and from his possessions who does not fulfill this promise. Even thus may he be shaken out and emptied. And all the assembly said, Amen. And they praised the Lord. Then the people did according to this promise. Now, you know, this was something, uh, a custom where he was, he was shaking out his garment. And this was a way of threatening what God would do if they went back on their promise. And what did all the people say? They said, Amen. We're going to do it. And, and they agreed to this change. And so we've seen, number one, the complaint. We've seen, number two, the condemnation. And what we see, number three, is the conduct by Nehemiah, right? He is a man that, if you study this book, he's someone that always backs up his words with action, right? Um, he walked the walk and, and, and talked the talk, as they say. Now, the rest of this, this chapter deals with the, the, the final action of Nehemiah that he took to overcome this internal strife. After all the action that we just read about, he takes one final uh, step. He's going to show by example how he is a steward of what God gave him. So notice the first conduct. He showed godly conduct. Look at verse 14 of Nehemiah 5. He says, Moreover from that day that I was appointed to be their governor in the land of Judah, from the 20th year to the 32nd year of King Artaxerxes, for 12 years, neither I nor my kinsmen have eaten the governor's food allowance. So he tells us the years here, the 20th to the 32nd, and he spells it out that it was 12 years, right? And he says, you know, we, you know that he did not eat the governor's food allowance. Now we see his humility here and, 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 and his willingness to identify with the people. He's, he's, very, he's a very humble person. He's not like me who wrote the book. Have you heard about my book? Hum- humility and how I achieved it? <laughs> Let me know when you get it now. But he's, he's, <laughs> he's truly humble and he identifies with the people. Verse 14, neither I nor my kinsmen have eaten the governor's food allowance. Now remember, he was the king's cupbearer. And if you know anything about the cupbearers, they were the closest to the king, right? They tasted the king's food. They probably had the responsibility of hiring the cooks and all the people who were in the household. And he was that last person. He tasted the food before he got to the king and drank the king's drink before he got to him so that if he keeled over, the king knew that his food was poison. So the king had to trust him um, very much. And so he had a high position. And then he was the governor of Judah. This was a lucrative job. And the king, we see here, was still providing a food allowance. Now we might think that the food allowance was going to come from the king's treasury and he's going to send a check to Nehemiah every month. No, the food allowance came from the people. You know, the, the taxes is almost like states. We have state tax and that pays for the things there and, and then we have the federal tax. And so this was what was going on in Judah. The people would have to pay the, for the food allowance uh, for the governor. And, and he had a right to take part of this. But why did he mention this? Because even though he thought he was entitled to the benefits, 
it was the people that would provide the food. Nehemiah did that because if he took the food from the people, he would then be guilty of the same things that he was just accusing the nobles of. He condemned the nobles for that. But he says in verse 15, But the former governors who were before me laid burdens on the people and took from them bread and wine besides 40 shekels of silver. This shows how the former governors had taxed the people and they were, they were using uh, their, their power to get what they could. But Nehemiah did not do the same thing. The former governors had done that even in times of difficulty. And he said, I'm not going to do that. Why? Because at the end of verse 15, because, but I did not do so because of the fear of God. Wow. It didn't matter to him what others did. He lived by another standard. He lived his life out of the fear of God. He was not even trying to win favor among the people. He didn't care about re-election or, 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 or any, anything. It was because he loved God and he feared God. Which begs the question for us. How do we live our lives? Is it to gain approval from other people? Or, or do you act because you love and fear God? Now, notice his other conduct, letter B. He conducted hard work. He says in verse 16, I also applied myself to the work on the wall. Nehemiah gave all his attention to rebuilding the wall. He didn't get anything from his work. The only thing that he received was the satisfaction of doing a good job and of serving God in this way. He wasn't doing this for the money because he wasn't getting any money. And I think what we need today are more of God's people to get to work on the wall of the church of God and and to be satisfied only because we're serving God. We have to stop the casual Christianity where we come or serve if we feel like it. We need to work hard. And he was trying to model this. He, He was trying to demonstrate this by being an example. But notice the third thing there is that Nehemiah demonstrated honesty. His his conduct was demonstrated by hard work. And then we see in verse 16, he says, We did not buy any land, and all my servants were gathered there for the work. These were tough times, and Nehemiah, he already had access to vast resources. He already had resources. He could have done what people had done, in terms of, you know, buy low and sell high. He could have taken advantage of the people. That could have been for his own purposes, that, hey, you know what? I'm going to buy up all this land, and and then sometime later I'm going to sell it back to the people for a profit. He didn't do that. But notice also he performed generosity. He says in verse 17, Moreover, there were... At my table, 150 Jews and officials, besides those who came to us from the nations around, that were around us. Anybody here want to feed 150 people every night? You think you could handle it? Amazing. And this was all at his own expense. Not only did he not take when he could have, but he also gave when he didn't have to. And so he is feeding as many as 150 people regularly. This was a lot of food. Look at verse 18. Now that which was prepared for each day was one ox and six choice sheep. Also birds were prepared for me. And once in 10 days, all sorts of wine were furnished in abundance. Yet for all this, I did not demand the governor's food allowance because the servitude was heavy on this people. Wouldn't it be great if uh, those in, in the Senate and the House said, you know what, the economy is really bad right now. We're going to forgo voting in raises for ourselves so that it would be easy on the people. <laughs> Imagine? We would be, <laughs> Yes. And this is like for Nehemiah. He didn't take what he could have. He said, you know what? The the servitude is heavy on the people. 
I'm not going to continue to fleece them. Again, these were at least 150 people. That was a lot of food. And then we see, if you've ever studied this book, we see Nehemiah do something that he does throughout the book. He closes with a brief prayer. Look at verse 19. He says, Remember me, O my God, for good, according to all that I have done for this people. Some people say that this prayer sounds self-serving. And they say, oh, he's just practicing his righteousness in front of man. Like like Jesus said, don't do that. And they say this sounds self-serving. Like uh, maybe even that he's bargaining with God. But I think what Nehemiah is doing is recognizing God's gracious promise. Remember me, oh my God, for good, according to all that I've done for this people. You know, he's, he's, he's remembering God's promise that he will take care of the needs of those who walk with him. And Nehemiah wasn't looking for praise of man, but from God. He's turning his heart and tuning his heart to God through prayer, which is what we should also do. Our prayers should not be human-directed, but God-directed. See, true unity only comes from God. Yes, you did too. I did not. Thus the little quarrel started. Thus by unkind little words, two friends were parted. I'm sorry. So am I. Thus the little quarrel ended. Thus by loving little words, two fond hearts were mended. Isn't that great? James Montgomery wrote the following poem. They walked with God in peace and love, but failed with one another. While sternly for the faith they strove, they fell out with each other. But he in whom they put their trust, who knew their frames, that they were dust, with pity, healed their weakness. He found them in the, his house of prayer with one accord assembled and so revealed his presence there. They wept for joy and trembled. One cup they drank, one bread they broke, one baptism shared, one language spoke, forgiving and forgiven. Then forth They went with tongues of flame in one blessed theme delighting the love of Jesus and his name, God's children all uniting. That love, our theme and watchword still, the law of love may we fulfill and love as we are loved. That's our goal here at Chapel on the Hill, having unity in all things. But that kind of unity only comes from our Savior. And that kind of unity is practiced for the glory of God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you with humble and grateful hearts for your word and its call to unity. Just as you stirred Nehemiah to gather your people and to restore what was broken, we ask that you draw us closer together in spirit that we might rebuild as one. Remind us that our strength lies in unity and that we're called to love one another as you have loved us. Forgive us, Lord, for any ways that we've allowed this unity to weaken our witness and divide our hearts. As the poem I just read reminds us, it is easy to walk in faith yet fail to walk in love with one another. 
Heal our hearts, Lord, where there is division. Soften us to forgive and to seek forgiveness and renew our commitment to walk together as one body, bound by the love of Christ. And as we go forth and we pray that you help us to carry this message of of grace and to help us to speak words that build up and not to tear down. Let the love of Christ be our constant theme and guide, binding us together. May we fulfill your law of love, embracing one another in the unity of your spirit as we work and worship together. We pray all of this in the matchless and precious name of Jesus our Lord and our Savior. Amen. Amen. Would you stand as we sing our hymn of response?